This morning, we are in the final message of our study through the book of Galatians. We have uh, enjoyed, well, I hope you've enjoyed the previous 10 weeks we have spent going through these six chapters. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and so it is with some sadness that we come to an end. It's like the last day of camp. Remember that feeling? Like, oh, no, back to my parents, back to the real world. And, well, unless you didn't like camp, then it's kind of like the first day of camp for you. But either way, it's with some sadness that we come to the end of our study of Galatians. It's been a great book. It's been theological. It's been challenging. It's been encouraging. Uh, so this morning, what we'll do, uh, we have seven verses left, which we'll cover this morning. Uh, but I'll do a quick overview or recap on a few of the highlights. Uh, I just want to make sure that some of the key parts of this book um, don't reside in your short-term memory. Uh, So we'll double down on a couple of things that we have gone through in the past uh, couple of months just to make sure that uh, it's cemented into your thinking. Now, Paul's conclusion of this letter has so much authorial wisdom. He resolves this letter perfectly. It's a wonderful conclusion to the book, which we'll go through this morning. But before we settle into our theme, our lesson for this morning, I just want to remind you of a couple of things that hopefully uh, stand out or are um, kind of major themes of the past six chapters. So the overriding theme of Galatians is that man cannot save himself that we are completely dependent on Christ. There isn't anything you can do to gain merit. Uh, There is no um, merit bank account that you can contribute to to get some extra favor from God that would qualify you, be a good uh, prerequisite to get salvation, that we are spiritually bankrupt in this process of salvation and Paul goes to great lengths to make sure that people understand that, that it is not by your works. So we must lock that into our thinking. Uh, He instructs the Galatians in the first chapter to not tolerate anything that is contrary to the gospel. He even says, if an angel from the Lord comes and tells you something different, discard it. You got to protect the purity of the gospel message. Uh, Paul is very intentional uh, to not only cover doctrines concerning salvation, but the second half of the book is going to drill down on sanctification. So it's not just about the theology, it's also about the practical living of that theology. And so Paul spends some time going through what it is to walk in the Spirit, uh, what it is to have the fruit of the Spirit, and that, and and let me just read what it said in chapter 3. Let me ask you only this, which is funny that Paul says that because he then goes on to ask him a series of questions, but let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This is Paul making the point, you're saved in the Spirit, now walk in the Spirit. Okay, so that's what he, Paul went through in chapter 3. In chapter 4, Paul introduces the doctrine of adoption. He talks about how we are sons and daughters of Christ and co heirs with Christ, and that's a, a doctrine which isn't talked about a whole lot. Uh, and by the way, if anything I'm saying, if you've missed any of these, by all means, go to the church website and catch up on some of these, because all of these topics come together to give a, a really great picture of what Paul is trying to do in this letter. One of the constant themes of this letter is the insufficiency of the Mosaic law. That's a a big talking point. Paul's trying to get them to understand. The law is insufficient for salvation. It doesn't mean anything to salvation. And that was difficult. That was difficult for people at that time because that old covenant, that sacrificial system, that law of Moses, had defined them for thousands of years. And now Paul is saying, yeah, that's not relevant now because it's been fulfilled in Christ and you don't have to do those ceremonies and those rituals and those customs. Those things, they don't mean anything now. You are in Christ. Well, if you've been doing that for a couple of thousand years, that's difficult to throw off. 
And so Paul spends much time confronting that. In fact, he circles back to that at the end of the letter, and we'll go through some of that today. But listen, before I read these final seven verses, uh, you know, we gather together on a Sunday, and I take the time to prepare a message, and then I share it with you, and hopefully it makes some sense, and you nod along, and kind of all in agreement. When we leave, whatever the, the, the Lord has kind of illuminated in your thinking, however you're being challenged, whatever your understanding is on what we go through, please don't leave it here in your pew when you leave. We need to take these things with us. There is nothing more discouraging as a pastor as to share and to want good things for the flock and to, to, give, uh, to give God's word to you as best as I can, and then for you to go away unchanged. Now, I'm not responsible if you change. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's your obedience. It's between you and the Lord. But I implore you, as we come to the end of this book, let's not feel good about the fact that we got through it, we learned some stuff, we understand the book of Galatians, and then your life is unchanged. So we must take seriously our responsibility to allow God to transform us and for it to influence our decisions and our relationships. So I would ask that as we finish this study, please continue to grow in these things. Turn with me, Galatians chapter 6. Grab your Bibles, Galatians chapter 6. You can go to Ephesians 1 and then back it up a few verses if that's easier for you. I don't know why that would be easier for you. <laughs> okay, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. This is Paul, his final words final benediction to the churches in Galatia. See with what large letters I am writing to you, and with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in the flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Brothers, amen. Okay, let's go through this. Let's, just, let's start on verse 12, because there's a, something I really want, I want to lift out of just that one verse. It says this, if it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecu persecuted for the cross of Christ. So those that he's talking about, he says, uh, it is those who want to make uh, a good showing. The, the those <laughs> are the Judaizers. Remember them? We went through them back in chapter 1. The Judaizers, those troublemakers, they're the ones that uh, proselytized the need for, to, maintain, to keep the law of Moses. They were like a hybrid religion, a belief system. They accepted Christ, they accepted death, death and resurrection, so they would have called themselves Christians, but then they said, but you have to observe the law. So it's this hybrid. So they added to the gospel, which means it's not a gospel. These men and women were likely not believers. These were the Judaizers, so we learned a little bit about them, but the, that was Paul's point throughout this letter is, no, you, you don't need the law. You don't add anything. You don't need circumcision. You don't need these things once you are in Christ because Christ fulfills all those things. Well, that's, that was difficult for them. And so we've spent enough time emphasizing that point. Christ, uh, he doesn't partner with anybody when it comes to redeeming the sins of mankind so I hope that point is front and centered in your mind. But I want to draw your attention to the last line of the verse. It says this, 
so that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So that, so that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So point one this morning is the cross is offensive. People don't like it. And we get a bit of an insight here as to what type of men these Judaizers were. They were willing, because they didn't want to be persecuted for the cross, because they didn't want to be criticized, because the Sanhedrin and the Jews and all those from the synagogue, they're all looking at the, the Christian message and they're critical. And they do not appreciate the abandonment of their responsibility to the temple. And so to minimize persecution, they brought in the law here a little bit because they didn't want to be persecuted for the cross. Well, listen, church, the, the cross is an offensive message. The death and resurrection of Christ undermined the Jewish system, a system that was no longer needed. If you are in Christ, which we are here, there is no need for those 600 plus laws that the Mosaic law had uh, constructed for believers, for those who are part of Israel. And throughout this letter, uh, circumcision is like the flagship um, ritual used to describe the law. And Paul is saying numerous times, Listen, circumcision regarding salvation, it's neither here or there. It doesn't mean anything to salvation. And so the Judaizers were more committed to upholding tradition and their preferences and the preferences of those who are not Christians. They would rather uphold the traditions and the preferences of the world than keep the gospel pure and be persecuted and take everything that comes with being in Christ. You might say, they didn't stand for righteousness. M many today do the same thing. There are many people that affirm or tolerate the things of this world to decrease criticism, to make it more palatable to a, a lost world. We understand why we do that, of course. Nobody wants to be criticized. Nobody wants to be persecuted. Nobody wants to be rebuked. Nobody wants to be resented. So the, the, the temptation is this, to take this thing, which is a magnet for criticism, and that is the gospel of Christ, and maybe dilute it a little bit. Play it down. Maybe just pull some of these un, um, offensive verses out. Or let's not talk about this in church. Imagine if I did that. Imagine if I only talked about the things that you all wanted to hear. What if I never talked about sin? What, what if I never talked about what it is to, to love and to die to yourself and to repent and to restore relationships and to take a stand against certain immoral things? What if I didn't go there because I didn't want to offend you? I didn't want to take your criticisms. First of all, you wouldn't like that. I would like to think that you would be disappointed that not being nourished in God's word fully. But this is what the Judaizers do, and this is what is the temptation, and a lot of churches, a lot of people do that these days, and it's sad. The Christian message is in opposition to the world's views and values. But we know that, right? That's no secret. We shouldn't be surprised then when we take a couple of arrows coming towards us. But that's what it is to stand for righteousness, to show that courage and to be strong. You take a stand for something and you say, no, I believe this is right and I believe this is uh, of God. I think God's word says it. And I know that it's not appreciated that you're taking that stand. But then when somebody kind of flinches at you like that, you can't just say, oh, okay, okay I won't talk about it. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I can't allow this into my faith. Now, we don't, we don't want to accommodate the things of this world um, to keep the peace, so to speak. Truth, by its very nature, is an irritant. Because truth is a judgment, a judgment on unrighteousness. I, I don't know how to avoid that. 
Well, I guess we could just not talk about truth. We could just not talk about righteousness, and then we're, we're good to go, right? Remember when Jesus said in Luke 6, uh, when, when he said, Woe to you when all people speak well of you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you are not causing people to feel something about the message that you're giving, then maybe you're not saying something that needed to be heard. He is saying, woe to you if you care about gaining the praise and adoration of men at the cost of compromising God's word. That's what the Judaizers did. They accommodated the law because they didn't want to be persecuted for the cross. That's what they did. And that's still the battle today. Listen, many resent the Christian message. Um, and I, I, I've, that becomes really difficult. This is where I have some compassion to those of you who have to deal with this. People resent the Christian message, and there's nothing more complex or difficult when the people that resent what you stand for the most are the people you love. Oh, that's difficult, right? I mean, we've got Thanksgiving coming up. You're about to sit around a table with some people that feel that judgment from you. I mean, you don't say it. I mean, I hope you're not saying that. I I hope you're not sitting at Thanksgiving saying, pass the yams and stop having premarital sex. (laughs) That's not useful. But people, there's that tension that exists, and somehow we have to navigate that. And listen, that is difficult. I I realize that, but I will say this. With that tension, God, God is faithful to these situations. We've got to be very prayerful. We've got to exercise a lot of wisdom and discernment. And don't be surprised what the Holy Spirit can do in someone else's heart, which you can't change the heart of that person. So many times, by God's grace and mercy, he can heal and unite relationships that are strained due to the difference, or strained due uh, due to you standing for righteousness. So I recognize that difficulty, but I don't think it has to be an either-or. I don't think it has to be... Well, I stand for what God's word says, and therefore, I will never speak to my family again. That's a a tragic ending to a relationship, because I believe it's not necessarily either that or that. I believe that God can do a work, and God can heal and unite, and he can truly lead you in that process of not compromising. Doesn't mean you won't be criticized and resented a little bit, but maintaining the beauty of that relationship and uh, through that, with, through that tenderness and that grace that we have, and I just want to uh, defer back to the teaching when we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. When somebody feels at odds with you because you have taken a stand, but you have love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness, self-control, long-suffering, when those things are manifesting in your life, it's really hard for them to relationally divorce you. Because those are beautiful things that are manifested by the power of the Holy Spirit while you're standing for righteousness. So yes, they will resent what you stand for, but they won't necessarily draw away from you if we have those qualities. Those qualities are present in our life. And you've got to understand, unsaved people, people that are of this world, the cross, it's foolishness to them. It doesn't really make any sense. It says in 1 Corinthians 1, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we have to have that understanding that that veil has not been lifted. The Holy Spirit has not brought life to the word, uh, the words of God's word yet in their life. And so it's hard for them to appreciate all the things that you appreciate as a believer. Think back to the Jewish community. The Jewish community were waiting for their Messiah, okay? They've got the prophets and their Jewish scriptures. And if you read through the prophets, someone's coming, their Messiah. And their Messiah, he's going to come, and he's going to conquer Israel's enemies, and he's going to be their king, 
He's going to sit on the throne of David. Oh, this is exciting. And then the one, Jesus, comes and gives up his life on the cross. Because it wasn't for Christ to be their king yet. That's a second coming. But you can understand why the cross is foolishness to them. Think about what they were expecting. They had an idea of who God should be. They had an idea of what things should look like. They had an idea of how it was all going to work itself out. Here he is, and no, not that. That's foolishness to them. And that's what people are dealing with when they don't understand or discern or perceive the things of Christ. They don't, people who are unsaved, who are offended by our faith, they don't have that conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is drawing men into himself. Don't get me wrong, the Holy Spirit is at work. But there are, when you're walking in the Spirit and you then about to walk in disobedience, you feel the Spirit of God pulling you back in. They don't have that. So we must understand that. But we must not accept anything that is contrary to his word. And the world desires for us to accept uh, them in their sin under every circumstance and it be an attribute and a beautiful thing in the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, it's just not. The truth is not very uh, tolerable. It's rather inflexible. Uh, it, it's polarizing. Truth is polarizing by its very nature. Okay, I'm not sure if this illustration is going to work very well. But two plus two doesn't equal five, right? And that is equally wrong as saying two plus two equals 100. So truth is, it's a narrow path. It's two plus two equals four. Anything else is not right. So we don't get to kind of take the, the word of God and just hold to the, to the, the what, the essentials or the, Oh, it's not a salvation issue, so I'm going to stay away from everything else. You can't just modify and change and bring impurity to God's word and think that it's okay. Even if you're just a little bit off, even if it's just two plus two equals five. That's, you, when, you're, when you're in school and math, and if you had written five, they wouldn't give you half a point for being close. <laughs> Truth is polarizing by its very nature. And I know that that's a little bit offensive to people. We all know that. And I'm sure you've heard all the objections. How, how can you say that Jesus is the only way? Well, yeah, I understand how that sounds. I understand there seems like there's a narrow-mindedness with it. But that same narrow-mindedness is true when it comes to 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we're all okay with that. But we must not bring any impurity to God's word, and we must not, for the sake of peace and quiet, and for the sake of not drawing any negative attention or persecution, change what is true and right about God. Our fidelity to God's word and who he is should not scale with the level of persecution that we are getting. Okay. And I probably, I probably need to insert this point uh, uh, just to make sure that I'm not being misunderstood. Being resented because you're standing for righteousness, uh, that's one thing. Being resented because you're ungracious and unloving and annoying to someone, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't think that, oh yes, I've offended everybody. I must be doing great. There's clearly a distinction. We know that, right? And I think that uh, I touched on this a little bit on Sunday night for those that were here. As we stand for righteousness, as we stand our ground, put a flag on the ground, we must do so, or we must wrap that conviction in love and grace. You, there's, there's nothing worse than somebody being right and being ugly and unloving at the same time. You're actually undermining the very thing you're putting, the, dragging the, putting your flag in the ground for. You're working in opposition to men discovering salvation in Christ. That's, that's a big deal to be getting in the way of that. 
So we must be loving. We know 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about this. It doesn't matter what you say, if they don't, people don't feel your love, then as you're talking, telling them about, what's, about Christ, all they can hear is this clanging cymbal sound coming out of your mouth. So 1 Corinthians, we know that. Look, church, the Bible is clear on what is right or wrong. These things are not really ambiguous. Uh, people have tried to say on some difficult talking points that they're complicated and the Bible's vague. The Bible's not vague on these things. I will, I will agree that it is a very difficult thing. Anything surrounding a lot of the, the social issues today on racism or transgenderism or the LGBT community and some of these difficult things to talk about, it, it's not difficult to figure out what's right or wrong. It's difficult how to show love and how to reach these people and how to have a good conversation with these people. Yeah, that, that is a little bit difficult, but difficulty is not evidence for it, the Bible being silent on those things. Let's move on. Love and grace must be present as we take a stand. Okay, verses 13 and 14. It introduces this concept of boasting. Now, let me just read that, verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Okay, so point two this morning is that we are to boast in the Lord. One, the cross is offensive. Two, we are to boast in the Lord. In, in multiple epistles of Paul, he talks about this, this boasting concept. He talks, most notably in 1 Corinthians 1, probably the one that may be in your thinking. Paul says, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And now he's citing Jeremiah, because he, he said there, as it is written. So he is uh, hearkening back to the prophets, Jeremiah 9, 24, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. We must boast in God. That's how Paul's finishing here. He's saying, hey, these people, they want to boast in the flesh. I'm going to boast in the cross. Back in 1 Corinthians, we must boast in the Lord. Going back to the Old Testament, boast in the Lord. So what does it mean to, what does it mean to boast? Um, because, I, I mean, I think we all have a sense of what boasting is. I just think it's a tiny bit more uh, in the, the language that the Bible's using. Uh, often, by, uh, boasting was used in a military context. Um, remember in the movie Gladiator, when Russell Crowe, uh, who's from New Zealand. <laughs> I just did a finger point to the only other New Zealander in the room over there. <laughs> Remember when Russell Crowe, he's rallying the troops. They're all lined up, and I think maybe he's on his horse or something, and he's walking, and he's doing a speech. And he's saying, men, we will not be beaten on this day. Our horses are the fastest, our swords are the sharpest, or whatever, right? This is, this is, this is boasting. This is a boast. Because what he's doing is he's uh, trying to get everybody's confidence and hope to be in whatever it, whatever it is that he's saying. And in this case, he's, he, you know, these soldiers who are about to possibly go to their certain death, he wants to equip them. He wants to strengthen them. He wants them to have hope. He wants them to believe. He wants to give them something to hold on to. So he appeals to these things. Our shields, our swords, our horses. That is a boast. I share that usage of the word boast because I think it helps us get a sense on why Paul is saying don't boast in the flesh. Boast only in the cross. You can see why Paul really values boasting in God only because when it comes to our hope, our confidence, our deliverance, our success, it can only be established in God. Boasting is to give glory to something. It is that object in our life that is to be revered. We boast in that. Now, the problem is, is we all boast in something. 
You're not boasting in the Lord, you're boasting in something else. It's kind of in our human nature to want to esteem and boast. Well, verse 13, referring to the Judaizers again, he condemns them for boasting in the works of the flesh. I mentioned earlier that circumcision being the sign of the old covenant. This was an artifact uh, or a, um, a characteristic of Jewish tradition. And they're boasting in those things. And Paul is boasting in the death and resurrection of Christ, which replaced that thing that they are boasting in, the Judaizers are boasting in. So there are two truths that Paul has drilled into the Galatians. One, you did not earn your salvation. You were saved by grace. And if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, the fruit of the Spirit, that's the power of the Holy Spirit who produces in you. You don't muster up the fruit of the Spirit in your own life. You don't produce in your own life. That is the work and the responsibility of the Holy Spirit as you are walking in obedience to God's Word Holy Spirit is producing fruit in your life. So what do we know about our role in, as Christians? We didn't save ourselves. In fact, we were spiritually bankrupt with our contribution to salvation. So we didn't do anything there. And then we were saved by the free gift of grace. And then once we were saved, anything that's good that's being produced in our life is the work of the Holy Spirit. So who should we boast in? Most certainly not us. We must boast in the Lord. What are the Judaizers boasting in? Well, we still do circumcision. Well, we sacrifice. Well, we do this ritual. We do these things. And they're boasting in that. And you know what's sad about that boast? It doesn't deliver. It's a failed system. Imagine if Russell Crowe and his boast with the soldiers said, My people, soldiers, we have big pieces of cardboard to defend their arrows. We will will cloak our heads with paper. Now he's boasting in what? Nothing. Well, way to go, Russell. That doesn't help anybody. We need to boast in that which is faithful, steadfast, true. We must boast in the Lord only. No point... Uh, boasting in anything that doesn't deal with your sin. No point boasting in a pastor. He's not useful. There's no point boasting in anything else other than the one who will not fail us. And so Paul perfectly closes out this whole letter with drawing that attention back to God. He said, with everything I've said, I'm going to boast in God. I'm going to boast in the cross. I'm not going to do what you're doing. Because why? Because back in um, chapter 1, remember how Paul had to defend his apostolic ministry? Remember how he was being criticized? And so he had to defend himself. He had to draw some attention to himself and lay out his credentials or vindicate himself so that the message was not compromised. I doubt highly Paul liked doing that. Because Paul didn't want to draw any attention to himself, and he had to. He, did it, he had to do that at the beginning of the letter, which is why I believe at the end of the letter he was very intentional to deflect everything back to God, to remove any of uh, him drawing attention to himself. In fact, Paul had to do that back in 2 Corinthians. And I won't get into that, but much of 2 Corinthians is Paul having to defend himself, and he even says, I don't want to boast in myself. I have to draw, I have to Lay out my rap sheet and my credentials so that you'll believe the message which is at hand. Paul does not want to boast in himself. He had to at the beginning. He wasn't really boasting, but he did draw some attention to himself. And so now, any attention that might be residual still on him, he's like, I'm going to boast in God. I'm going to boast in the cross only. So that is how Paul is going to close out this letter. So point two this morning is that we need to boast in the Lord. We need to put our trust, our confidence, our excitement, and our energy only in God. If you are a person that puts some of your little bit of attention or glory in your successes, well, that's a risky move because your successes can rise and fall. 
or if you put your confidence or your boasting in your skill set or your spiritual gift. The irony with you putting your boasting and confidence in those things is God's the one who gave them to you. Ironically, so here you are boasting in something you shouldn't. You should be boasting in the Lord. And, you boast, and even if you should boast in those things, which you shouldn't, they're not even yours. God gave them to you. So it really is an unuseful exercise, boasting in the wrong things, which brings me to my third point. We are to boast in, if, when we boast in anything other than God, we are stealing from God. We are stealing his praise and his honor when we boast in anything else other than him. In the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses this very issue with both the church folk and the leadership. And he does this because it seems that he and his ministry partner, Apollos, have received some um, undeserved praise or praise that he didn't want. So he says in chapter 4, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Meaning, if you have this wonderful gift, why are you boasting as if you did not receive it from God? He's saying the same of himself. Yeah, okay, so maybe you appreciate myself and Apollos and whatever ministry we've been doing, but it's not us. I received it from God. So there's no point appreciating or boasting in anything I've done. Remember, they were, those people were like, oh, I'm off Apollos. Oh, I'm off Paul. I'm off Timothy. What? All those people are of the Lord. Anyway, anytime we boast in ourselves or others, we are taking from God. We are taking praise that belongs to God. So you don't want to steal from the Almighty God. Boasting in yourself is pretty hopeless as well. If you have a high view of God, you're going to have a low view of man. And that's, that's good. That's appropriate. Listen, we are fallible. We are prone to fail. It is a poor decision to boast in yourself. If, listen, if man's effort, if, if any one of you could make yourself right with God, if any one of you could produce the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you could, then by all means, boast away. And hopefully no one here is sitting there thinking, I think that's me, I think that's me. <laughs> None of us can boast in anything because we contributed nothing. We are so fallible. The Judaizers boasted in themselves. Listen to this. Okay, so these, these bozos, they boasted in themselves. Okay, Paul boasted in the cross. But notice what he says in verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. Why on earth? Here they are, walking around, all pious, high and mighty, boasting in the law. They don't even keep the law. It's not even working for them. They're boasting in something that they are failing in. Their, little, their boast has broken down before it's even really got going here. Man, when I say man, by the way, I'm talking about mankind. I'm not just saying men, uh, although maybe this next point is more men, but man is inclined to esteem his own works. We have this little disposition. Remember those haunting words of that person who was on the Titanic, on that maiden voyage? God himself could not sink this ship. <laughs> I actually don't even know if that's real that somebody said that. <laughs> As I'm thinking right now, I don't even know if this is true. I'm under the impression that somebody said that on the Titanic. I don't know if it was the captain or whoever it was, but oh, that's the height of man's arrogance, right? Boasting in his own work. Boasting in his own work to the degree that he is even saying, even God himself could not sink this ship. Well, we all know how that one went, so that was... If you believe your greatest feats and gifts, if you believe that your greatest feats and gifts that have been 
that they were that these virtues were bestowed upon you by you, then your narcissism will be the explanation when you fall. There, there, is, there is nothing in us, there is nothing in any pastor, any celebrity pastor, any, and no one else. doesn't matter how much you admire them and how much you love them and how much of a great thing God's doing in and through them. It is still a glory that is due only to God. Uh, First Corinthians, I wasn't going to make this point, but I may as well, because I, I don't know, just started talking right now. <laughs> For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Paul makes this point. God has saved us. God has sanctified us by what he did on the cross. We are clothed in righteousness. I spat a good amount there. Did anybody see that? I'm going to go ahead and pat down my arm hairs with that spit right now. We're going to edit that part out of the video because... I shouldn't have said anything because nobody saw it. Did you see me spit? Did anybody? No? Okay. Casey, did you see anything? No? Now I don't know what I'm... I truly don't know where I'm at right now. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay, let me just jump in at one of these lines here and see if it works out. In 1 Corinthians 3, So let no one boast in men... For all things are yours. When Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. We must boast fully and only in God. Uh, when you boast in other people or when you put confidence in other people or when you uh, depend on them, you are actually, in a sense, placing them above Christ. A very unuseful exercise. Let me flip this one. Let me flip that concept. We also should desire that people don't boast in us. Do you remember, I, I shared this, uh, I don't know, last week maybe, I talked about in Galatians 5.26 when it talked about not being conceited, not being provoking, and not being envious. If you are those things, if you have not refined those character flaws in your life, then you are going to crave that kind of attention. You are going to want to hear, oh, did you hear or see what Morgan did? Oh, what an amazing thing or whatever, right? That's what we're going to do with the people around us. We're going to esteem them and we're going to boast in them. And we're going to crave that if we do have that conceited part of us. Remember that word conceited means to want to draw attention to yourself, to get life from celebrating your own achievements, you're going to want people to boast in you. So not only should we boast in God, but we should also live a life that is trying to be invisible so that God would get all the glory. We must not steal God's honor and praise. This, might, this next illustration may um, just understate things a little bit, so I don't know if it's going to be super useful, but I think you all know that feeling when someone else you love gives praise or gives credit or gives thanks or gives admiration to someone else for something you did. Like just even at an earthly level, that just eats you up. I would feel that way. I would feel jealous if Ashley admired another person, especially if it's something that I had actually done. I would be jealous, and God is a jealous God, and, and rightly so. So when we boast in other things and we steal from God, that is a form of idolatry. Now, Paul, a man by, who, by earthly standards, he actually had a reason to boast. You and I probably don't have quite the reason to boast. Uh, we, uh, our, our achievements probably in the shadow of Paul's. But he was a, a brilliant man. In, in so many ways, and he lived a life that many of us would inspire to live, and he dare not draw attention or have anybody boast in him. So, for you and I, how even if, if we've got to follow in the lead of Paul here, 
we too are not worthy and deserving of being boasted upon. All right, let's go down the home stretch here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, the last few verses here, says, And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Okay, so just um, when it says, by this rule, uh, he's referring to the message of salvation being through grace and faith alone. He's saying, by this rule, you're going to have that peace and mercy that can only come through God as we walk in obedience to that rule. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul is referring to the scars on his body. Oh, he has been persecuted. He has been persecuted. Remember the Judaizers? Oh, I don't want to be persecuted for the cross. Paul, hey, I have, it's all happened to me. I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, whipped, jailed, stoned. It's all happened. I have the scars to prove it. So he has suffered by way of persecution for Christ's sake. And in this final benediction, Paul reminds the reader that they are, if they are recipients of God's, that they will be the recipients of God's peace and mercy and that we may suffer for his sake. And we must remain pure in the gospel. We must walk in the Spirit. We must realize that it is fully God and His Holy Spirit in and through us, working all things out for His good. He is the one that is producing in us. We must walk in obedience to His Word. And if we do that, and if we follow that, we will have that peace and we will have that mercy of God. And while we're doing that, we must not compromise. We must be willing to hold the line for truth. And maybe we'll be criticized. Maybe we'll be persecuted for that. Well, come what may when it comes to standing for the Lord. Our fidelity and our commitment to God is first and foremost. And Paul resolves this letter by saying, I am going to boast in the Lord.